opportunity to um, address a most crucial theme to a most uh, incisive and decisive group of people in the life of the church. I state the obvious when I say that uh, in recent years the question of Catholic identity has been the hot question right across the Western world. <coughs> Not just in this country, but uh, in every country that I know in the Western world, the, uh, the question of Catholic identity has be become really uh, the key question. And one of the questions which that in turn prompts is why is that so? Because back in the 50s when I was a good Catholic boy growing up in Adelaide then, um, it, th the question of Catholic identity just didn't intrude at all. It was taken for granted. But th that's no longer the case. Now, to understand why the question of Catholic identity has become so vital, I think we need to understand that the quite tumultuous and in some ways convulsive changes that have happened in the Catholic Church over the last 100 years. In other words, the roots of our questioning go deep. If you go back and look uh, across that century, you'll see that one of the things that has happened is that where a hundred years ago or, or even less, about 70% of the, of the Catholic Church was in the so-called North, uh, basically a Eurocentric Church, and 30% was in the so-called Third World, that percentage in the meantime has been completely overturned. So that we face a situation now where in the Catholic Church worldwide, about 70% of the church are in the so-called third world countries, particularly Africa and Latin America, Asia I'd throw in too. But 30% uh, now is uh, in the Western world or the Northern Hemisphere as it's so-called, called, so called, even though we are ourselves in the South. Uh, the, the, the North tends to be rich and ageing and secular and the South where 70% of the church lie is poor, young and intensely religious. Now I don't know where all that's going to take us, but that demographic shift as it were at the heart of the Catholic Church is one of the major reasons why the question of what does it mean to be Catholic, the question of Catholic identity impinges. But if you look at it historically again, in the, that last hundred years there have been the two world wars. They were really two parts of a single apocalyptic conflict, the great emblems of which finally turned out to be Auschwitz and Hiroshima. And beyond the ash heaps of Auschwitz and Hiroshima, nothing could ever be the same again. Uh, certainly the Catholic Church, and con uh, consider that both those wars were essentially European conflicts, though with global consequences, and that the protagonist in both parts of the conflict was one of the unquestionably great Christian nations and in part one of the great Catholic nations of Europe, Germany. Now, nothing could be the same beyond Auschwitz and Hiroshima, both of them technological triumphs and moral catastrophes, it could be argued. Certainly the Catholic Church was in no position just to put up a sign saying business as usual. You know, once, once peace was finally declared in 1945, putting up a sign, business as usual, would have been the height of irresponsibility on the part of the church. My own view is that the Second Vatican Council was really uh, a reaction to or res a response to the apocalypse that was symbolised in Auschwitz and Hiroshima. In other words, a recognition by the church under the prompting of the Holy Spirit that nothing could be the same again. And the question that blazes really at the heart of the Second Vatican Council, as I read the documents, is the question, what is the church? Uh, we sang a hymn when I was a kid, Who is she that stands triumphant rock in strength upon the rock, like some city crowned with turrets, braving storm and earthquake shock? Hers the kingdom, hers the scepter, fall ye nations at her feet. Now it's not bad poetry, but uh, as ecclesiology, as a vision of the church, it uh, is very far from where we would feel we ought to be now. Uh, and that, that's really because we inhabit the world beyond Auschwitz and Hiroshima. So the question at the heart of the Second Vatican Council is what is the church and in that sense the question is the question of Catholic identity. <coughs> in 
if we, we look at it locally, uh, you see other things. And this is not just in Australia, but again, I think across the Western world. The great apostolic works of the church for most of the last century or more were entrusted to religious orders. Some of them ancient, some of the, some of the more recent task forces, you could almost argue, which were founded in order to undertake these great apostolic works, particularly in the areas of education, health and welfare. Now, these religious orders, certainly in this country, did extraordinary things with almost no resources. I mean, what they had was the resource of their faith. And they built the education systems, the healthcare systems and the welfare systems that are really great jewels in the crown of the Catholic Church in a country like this. Now, for all kinds of reasons, that era is fading fast. The religious orders that ran those great institutions and that conducted those great apostolic works are, if not vanishing, they have certainly diminished in profile and presence to the point where they are receding from these institutions. Even if you look at a gathering like this, it would have been unthinkable 50 years ago. If you'd had 50 years ago, if you'd had a, a gathering of the financial administrators of the diocese, they would have been all of them priests. So, so this very gathering makes the point that there, there's, a, there's a massive shift away from clerical and religious leadership of key institutions into the hands of lay people. Symbolic of this is the emergence of these public juridic persons, which no doubt you've all caught up with. Now, they're a promising development, but no one quite knows where the ship is going to end up once we set the boat upon the tide of, of, of public juridic persons. The danger in it, it seems to me, is that there can end up being what I would call an ecclesial deficit, where we end up running good businesses, but are they the church? Now, you see, it seems to me that the church has to run according to the very best of business practices and principles, but we're not a corporation. So there has to be, as it were, an ecclesial mentality to avoid an ecclesial deficit. And what can creep up on us in a culture like this is a kind of corporate mentality. Even the best of us, under the pressure of having to run the thing, the pressure of having to manage can lead us to the point where almost unconsciously we are, as it were, succumbing to the spirit of the world. However good our intentions might be, and this is no moral judgment, but it's simply a fact, I think. So, at a point like this, where we are dealing with genuinely historic shifts, the question of Catholic identity, once taken for granted, no longer can be taken for granted. It, it, it does impinge. What does it mean to say that we're not running a corporation, we're running the church? What does it mean to say a school is Catholic? What does it mean to say a hospital or an aged care institution is Catholic? What does it mean to say that a welfare agency is Catholic? So it's across the board. Now, I don't think it's a question of being afraid of the loss of clerical control or, or religious leadership. We have to believe, I think, and there is an act of faith caught up in all of this, that, that the Holy Spirit is, is moving among us, but in ways that make this moment Abrahamic. Abraham was called to set out on a journey. The only problem is God didn't give him the road map or even tell him where he was going. It was a journey into the unknown. And I have to say in my years as bishop, if anything has come to me more clearly, it's that sense that we are living an Abrahamic moment. It's full of both threat and promise, but in such a moment it is important, it seems to me...